Welcome to the Inspiring Tech Leaders podcast with me, Dave Roberts. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Craig Walker, who is a strategic advisor for the office of the CEO at Salesforce. Craig has also held several senior roles at Shell, including the CIO for the downstream business and the global CIO for Shell Trading and Supply. During his time with Shell, Craig took on a number of overseas assignments in the United States, the Middle East, Colombia, and South Africa, while also working in both London and Aberdeen in the UK. Craig has previously held the role of an associate partner at KPMG Consulting, where he managed large-scale system implementations and change management programs for global clients. Craig has a chemical engineering degree and is also an advisor at the Institute of Coding. He is a commercially focused technology executive known for driving results by developing high-performing teams and an inspirational leader who creates clarity of vision and purpose for people and organizations while driving a culture of innovation, continuous improvements, and high performance. What an honor to welcome you to the podcast today, Craig. Thank you very much, Dave. Very much appreciated being asked and uh, very happy to be here. So I'd like to start off by asking you, you know, how did you start a career in IT you know, after graduating with a, a chemical engineering degree? <laughs> well, that's well, quite straightforward, really. I'd have probably made the world's worst chemical engineer. Um, <laughs> but I enjoyed very much uh, programming. And, you know, you've got to remember, and it's quite scary, I, this June I would have graduated 40 years ago. And of course, PCs were not commonplace, but in our final year at, um, at the University of Surrey, we, we did have the start of some reasonable um, uh, computing there. And I just found it a fascinating thing to do. I think I enjoyed the, the logical thought processes and it either worked or it didn't. And that kind of appealed to me. Um, and I applied to a number of um, companies, as you always do, coming out as a graduate. And uh, a couple of other oil companies offered me jobs, but it was more as a chemical engineer first with the opportunity to do some IT, whereas Shell just said, no, we are we are recruiting heavily into IT. Yeah, come see us. So uh, that's how it started, really. And in those early days of being at Shell, you know, did you ever dream of becoming the, the global CIO for them? No, I don't think there was a global CIO then. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, off I went to Shell. Uh, they put a cohort of us through a as either a six or eight week structured COBOL course on HP 3000s, which, you know, this was the sexy machine. This wasn't the mainframes. This was the new up and coming, you know, beast. And um, no, I, I never dreamt of that. I thought I, I'd be a programmer, a project manager, an analyst. That would be my role in life. You know, you, you didn't kind of have the structure back then. IT organizations were very flat. You know, the shock to certainly my kids when I talk about it is there was no internet, there was no email. Um, machines sat in a in a office really and ran for that office. So, so a very different world. When you think about what a CIO copes with these days, and the global uh, footprint that that IT has, the cybersecurity, the regulations—I mean, you name it—it's it's such a different world. Absolutely, becoming more complex. All oh, the yeah. time. I, I, I think, uh, you know, certainly you mentioned about uh, compliance and regulation and things like that. And, you know, one of the things I, I've certainly noticed is it's gone from being a nice to have to actually, if you, if you want to be competitive and you want to be able to bid tenders, you, you have to have these things now. So it, it's becoming uh, de facto, well, you, you have to have them to do business. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's more than that. I mean, you are taking care you know, if I put my Salesforce hat on or my previous Shell downstream CIO hat on, right? You're you're taking care of other people's data, of other people's money, of other people's payment methods, of other people's history in some respects. And if you want to be a trusted supplier, if you want to be a trusted partner to them, you better take care of their data as if it were your own. So this isn't just about winning business per se. It's about your brand reputation. Absolutely. Um, it's about the reputation of your of your company. And that's just moved us to a wholly different world. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Going back to you know, Shell in those early days when yeah. you were there, you, know, you, you had lots of opportunity to travel and, and take on overseas assignments. Yeah. You know, you've got to have lots of stories and, and experiences <laughs> to tell them. You know, what knowledge did you gain from all that? I was incredibly lucky. We were a very lucky generation, many of us with the big companies. I think Today, it's very hard to have the same experience because you are in this work from anywhere world, right? We've all been doing it for the last year. But if you think about it, when I, you know, I've been with Shell three years in London, uh, part of that story would be uh, my Australian boss took me out. We got quite drunk. He fell asleep on the train and ended up in Portsmouth or somewhere. And I woke up on the floor of my new flat I'd just bought and went, 
did I agree to go to Saudi Arabia last night? I, I think I might have. And, and so off I went to Saudi. We built a couple of lending plants, one in Riyadh and one in Jeddah. And then subsequently after that, I went on to um, be the IT manager in Dubai for Shell Markets and Shell Trading Middle East. But I was 24 years old. I was 26 when I took over that other role. You, you couldn't call head office because the phone calls were too expensive and or you couldn't get through. We communicated via telex. So you were sent to these countries by these big companies because they thought you were the sort of person who could go there and make it happen. And, and a lot of the other people there with you were a similar age from, say, 25 through to about 40. And it was a very exciting time. Yeah, we were out there, you know, in my case, in the Middle East for six years at a time when those places were really starting to develop. Industry, business was was taking off. You know, the case of Dubai had been a thriving trading center on the Silk Route for hundreds of years. But now it was becoming something quite different. Nothing compared to what it is today. It was still a little town. But when I meet up with my old friends from those days, we've all actually done pretty well uh, in terms of our careers. And we look back on those days and say, you know why? We had to go out there. We had to take responsibility. We were empowered. We made the decisions. We made it happen. So, you know, I remember taking over from, um, from a colleague to be the IT manager for those two um, companies in Dubai. And I remember saying, you know, Stan, I don't know whether I can do this. You know, how much do I really know? And he went, hey, you know more about IT than anyone else in the building. Let them run the business. Yours is to run IT. And you'll make mistakes and you'll learn from it, but you can't do anything too bad, right? Because it's contained. It's, you're not part of a bigger thing. So make the decisions you think you should make. Understand how to put forward arguments to executives and thought leadership. And, and basically, one day I would be on the floor of the computer room with my screwdriver. I only had a department of about six people. And... The next day, someone very important from Shell Center might have arrived and I had to present to them on what I was thinking about doing on IT. It was a fabulous training ground. It was a fabulous training ground, not just in the technology and ways of working and talking to executives and learning how to present and put forward arguments, et cetera, but even about just working in a different country, appreciating ethnic differences, appreciating different ways of working, appreciating different cultures. And I think it's in our more homogenized world now where I can fire up this and talk to my boss in another part of the world. It's not the same experience. You don't learn to be as self-confident maybe, or as self-motivated as you were back then. Does, does that no, make sense? It does. Cause you know, you're in the middle, middle of it, living it. It's not just yes. the, the, the end of your, your zoom call and you're on to the next thing you're, you're there. You know, that is really about the, the courageous leadership yes. needed on the ground all the time. So that, that's, so that's I think you, you know, learned so much, but you didn't realize at the time how much you were learning because you didn't know how much the world was going to change. And I, and I think preparing you for management and leadership as you then go through your career, you can't do better than to be out there somewhere by yourself and told to go make it happen. That sounds like a, a, a great experience to go through. But yeah, you, you spent 17 years initially with Shell yeah. You know, what, what was then that, that driver to go and move into KPMG? Well, uh, you, you, you spent another six and a half years there, so you obviously enjoyed it. And you yes. <laughs> so well, what, I, what, 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 made, what made you do that? I had a fabulous run with Shell. And, you know, there was Saudi, Dubai. Then I went to Aberdeen, which I do consider overseas. Sorry to any <laughs> Scottish listeners. Uh, and then um, Columbia, South America, and then back to London. So, you know, it was a fabulous run. Great times, great friends, great work, great experience. But I felt all I knew after college was Shell. And, you know, Shell was going through a lot of issues at the time. There were some major challenges in the leadership. And, of course, that eventually led to the reserves crisis, et cetera. Not that I had a foreshadowing of that. But I felt I wanted to learn more. I wanted to be more challenged myself. I wanted to know what it was like to be outside of Shell. And um, through a number of circumstances, KPMG made an approach to me and said, well, you say you want to learn about other companies, you want to do this. Have you thought about becoming a consultant? And, and I suppose I hadn't really, uh, but, but, I, but I made the choice. It sounded like, it felt to me at the time, like a huge decision to leave something I'd known for 17 years and was kind of my family and shells. Very, very, uh, yeah, it's a great place to work. But that six and a half years at KPMG was really 
very eye-opening. Not only did I learn about a lot of other industries, uh, which I think really broadens you, but I actually learned about the softer skills, about change management, about transformation, about leadership when you don't have direct authority over people, when it is about inspiring and leading from the front and helping people go to a different way of working. And I think when I look back on it, it was that plus the experiences of the many different things I did. You know, I did a year down at Airbus in Toulouse as, as their uh, a global IT strategy person. Absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I just learned so much. And of course, it's a much flatter organization in a consultancy. Shell is very hierarchical, um, very conscious of the hierarchy, very conscious of the structure. It was fun to go and work somewhere that was very different, learn how to interact with people at the C-suite level across a whole range of companies. And, and I just learned so much. You know, I think it was a great thing to do. In fact, I always used to joke about it. After I went back to Shell, I said, you know, that was the best six-year training course Shell ever let me go on. <laughs> you know, I'm not convinced I would have turned out to be the leader or the people person or whatever I think or people tell me I am, had I not have gone and done that. So that, that was a, you know, a, a great experience for those, those six and a half years. But as you said, you did return to Shell and for, for another 15 years. Uh, and I, yeah. you, you were working in South Africa and, and the US and the UK. Yes. I first met you when you were um, during that period when you were back with Shell. And right. What I think was really interesting you know, when, when we spoke was how you were talking about the transformation of that business, becoming an energy business and you know, moving away yes. from mo- molecules to electrons and yeah. Yes. How was technology helping to drive such a significant organizational change? You take Shell. Well, you take many companies. You've only got to look at what COVID did to, to uh, many of our high street brands, right? Most companies have sold product, right? So the history of Shell has been about creating an incredible brand, as many other companies have done taking that brand or the pectin, putting it on a can or a bottle or a retail site or a barrel, and people recognize it the world over and say, wow, I know that's Shell. I know that's good stuff. I, I know that has product providence. Um, I know it's a quality brand. I know I might have to pay a little bit more, but you know, maybe my dad told me, maybe my friends have told me, I just know it's good. Mm. And so we were set up and all our systems were set up and all our reward systems, our organizational structures by vertical pillars of products. Even when we globalized in 2005 onwards, we went from being a very regional based company. Because if you go back to the history I talked about, we were all little companies around the world kind of doing our own thing under the brand umbrella, hence the Royal Dutch Shell group of companies. When we reorganized the company and we went global, it was still by product. Of course, what has happened and you know, this didn't happen in the early 2000s. I would say this was more 2013, 2014 onwards, mm-hmm. particularly because of the rise of the iPhone, uh, you know, smartphones in general, and what was happening in the marketplace was people now wanted more. People didn't just want the product. They wanted service with it. They wanted you to help them use the product to make themselves more successful, if that makes sense, right? Now, that's an issue. I I have salesmen who for the 30 years of their career in some of these big companies have sold volume. They got a nice house, a nice car, put the kids through college because they knew how to sell volume. They'd they'd turn up every year and say, hey, you know, uh, you maybe want to talk about the price. Uh, Maybe we can sell you some more of this, this and this. But it was all about volume. Then the customer started saying, you know, Shell, this is all very interesting, but could you help me use your products to get better, I don't know, a yield from my crops per acre? Could you help me? use your bitumen to increase the longevity of the surface of my road. Could you help me use your lubricants to get better asset uptime, longer time between a preventive maintenance? We didn't know how to do that. We didn't have the information to do that. And our salesmen were not incentivized that way. Now, as you move to service, this service is all based around information. It's about data. It's about, do I understand your piece of machinery as well as you understand it. In fact, can I, can I um, mix my lubricant data with the, all the IoT that's coming back off your, uh, off your equipment that may be going to the third party, or well, third party to me, but the supplier of that equipment? Could I get together with the supplier of that equipment 
And together by analyzing the data, we can give you a better service. Now, maybe I end up selling less lubricant to you, but you're using the lubricant better. So that gives you a better net carbon footprint and you're getting better assets uptime because I'm looking at, I don't know, temperature, pressure, idle times without a kit, uh, the, um, the strain you're putting it under, et cetera. But to do that, I need data and I need to be able to acquire, analyze and share data pretty much in real time to be able to really help you use my, my product, but turn it into a service that means you can use it a lot better. And if I don't do it, somebody else will, right? So, so were, you, were you working on uh, machine learning, AI, or you, you know, all those sort of big data projects and bringing oh, yeah. internal data sets, external data sets, and bringing them together at, at, at scale? Uh, that, that must yes. Be- to begin with, of course, you're not. To begin with, you're just trying to work out, well, what does the customer want from me? And it's as simple, Dave, as you know, if you've grown up in a world where it's by product and by region, if somebody turned around to me, you know, with a global, sorry, where you see I put my shell hat, my shell hat back on again. <laughs> a shell's the global supplier, first fill lubricants to BMW. BMW said to us, how much lubricant are we selling you? You'd think that's easy, but it's not. Because your global SAP system is set up, it may have BMW, it may have Bavarian Motor Company, and it'll be different addresses and different names across the world. We might even be selling through uh, through uh, distributors or resellers into their cars. How can we possibly tell them how much? So some, so one of your first problems is, do I even have a holistic view of my customers? And most companies don't. So I've got to get that together before I can even start analyzing at scale how much I'm selling to you, what are you using it for? Start to, as you say, use AI machine learning. But it's a simplistic use to start off with, say, to help my call center or to help my salesman have a better conversation with the customer by giving insight on when and where they're using our product and how they might use it better to deliver the success my customer is trying to achieve. Now, upstream, very different place, right? Research, very different place. Mm. Looking at massive data sets, applying very clever AI and algorithms to help us even go back over uh, years old um, seismic back to even you know the early 1900s where we might have missed oil or gas and re-looking at that through some very clever um, machine learning, et cetera. But in the downstream world around B2B and B2C customers, It's more about identifying trends, identifying utilization of product, mixing that with what I see coming from the world to help my salesman have a better conversation, give them more information in the moments to augment what they already know and help them in that sales process. And I know um, Shell were a very, or probably still are a very big customer of Salesforce, which is yes. yeah, now where you are as a strategic advisor in the office of the CEO at Salesforce. Yes. You know, I'm sure the experience that you had from, from Shell, you're now able to apply into other assignments and other clients in the, in the similar sort of way. So are you able to talk to us a little bit about the types of work that you're doing with, uh, with Salesforce at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, th- this is an incredible time of change. And you know, the, there are a whole bunch of reasons why this change has been accelerated. Clearly, we've just been through a pandemic, right? That had a huge economic impact. We also see a huge piece going on around climate change, sustainability, carbon, and we're in a time of quite significant social upheaval in certain parts of the world. People are looking to work in different ways as well, yeah? How many of us are gonna go back to an office? Are we gonna go to a new hybrid way of working? What is going to be the new routine? And when you look at this, you're really looking at a work from anywhere, sell from anywhere, service from anywhere type of world, yeah? Mm. And Salesforce has really uh, responded to this. I've only been here a year, but the response to this has been huge. And people who were going to implement things over a series maybe of 12 to 18 months suddenly accelerated and said, you know what? I have to come out of this pandemic. I have to come out of this crisis fitter and stronger than I've ever been before. I need to get close to my customers. I need to get close to what they want. And I need to serve them in the way they want to be served. You know, you think how fast curb pickup started, et cetera. We had many companies in the UK, some of which I feel have now gone to the wall, partly because they had no idea who their customers were. 
They had to shut down their stores, yet those stores were full of stock. They had no link between the physical and virtual world. They couldn't even arrange for customers to come and pick up that stock from the curbside. So this mingling of virtual and digital now, or virtual, digital, and physical is huge on everyone's agenda. People want to act with your company and interact with your company in the way that most suits them. And that doesn't necessarily mean always on the phone or through an application or always by coming to the store. It is a mixture of those things and they expect it to be seamless. You know, to give you an example of that in my own life, you know, every now and then my wife convinces me I really ought to go and buy a, a new shirt or something. And, you know, we live right in the heart of London. And so we go to an upmarket shop that let's say should remain uh, nameless, but um, uh, is a fairly well-known brand. And I might spend 30 minutes, three quarters an hour looking around. I find some things I want. Uh, I get the thumbs up of approval from my wife. It's far better taste than me. And I find a store and I go, I'd like this, this, and this. They go, oh, we haven't got it in your size, sir. And my reply is, well, that's okay. I'll pay for it all now and you ship it to me. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, if you want to buy it online and get it shipped home, you have to go home and order it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm in your store. I'm willing to part with my money. And you're telling me, oh, it's a different system. Oh, but if you want to go three miles up the road and walk to Oxford Street, we found our store has it there. No, I don't want to. Right. What sort of shopping experience yeah. is this? Yeah. So the technology all exists to bring this together. The technology exists to treat me as an individual based on information I'm very happy to give you because I don't want this to happen. I want to have a seamless experience. Is that is that contributing to the death of the high street, though, in, in some respects? I, well, I, I'm guilty as anyone else, because I think you've, you've gone a step ahead of me. You've actually gone to a store to do it. I think my, my <laughs> initial sort of reaction is, is to go online straight away because just because of how easy it is. And I, I, I know I, I probably shouldn't do that, but uh, it, it's well, in, in, I, the, in the lives that we live. It's uh, convenience. But I think this is the huge challenge now that 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 many companies, be they B2B or B2C, face coming out of this. So I will admit that in the year of, of when we were really in lockdown, I would suspect 70, 80% of non-food items we bought on Amazon. Why? Because it just works. It just works. I can find it easily. The search engine works well. The payment, it, it's, it's an absolute doddle. And the thing is really reliable and it tends to turn up the next day. I, I tried to use um, other uh, systems um, other people's websites, and they simply don't do that. Things go wrong, and you get frustrated and you don't go back. So this merging of the way I want to work and knowing enough about me not to be creepy, but enough about me to make it not easy to do business with, it's gone way beyond that, a pleasure to do business with you, that's where you've got to go, right? And it's not just about me and that customer, if you think about it from the internal company's point of view, I want to take the data. I want to share that data because the, the goal in the future is the ecosystem and the partnerships around me. So when I deliver to Dave, it's not just about him ordering off me. I'm going to share that data with the logistics company. I'm going to share that data with the supplier. I'm going to share that data with the service company. So when Dave gets this from me, he is going to be able to track it all the way through there. And I'm going to make my data available in the cloud. I'm going to use APIs. I'm going to let other companies um, come into that. I'm going to share my APIs on my portal with, with you, Dave, so you can track it yourself. All of those things is what I expect now from, from whatever I deal with. And Salesforce, you know, it's, I'm amazed. I think a lot of people just think Salesforce is a CRM. And, and I admit I did um, back in the early days of being a global CIO and realizing, um, you know, I knew I was replacing SAP CRM and Siebel with uh, Salesforce. So I, so I went, oh, good. I know what Salesforce does. Of course, Salesforce is huge. It, it, it's, it is really an incredibly powerful workflow, intelligent, analytical engine that you can apply to just about any business problem. And you can put a very elegant solution in place in the cloud. That, that's very secure and shares that data with the people who are key to you, you, your business being a success. They're adding value to your goods or services as it comes down the line. And that's the key to what people have got to do post this pandemic. It seems to be expanding all the time as well, uh, Salesforce. And I, I've been you know, really impressed with some of the 
services that, that they offer. You know, um, for example, Her- at the Heroku platform, uh, which is yes. a Salesforce a company, absolutely brilliant. You know what what, what they're doing there. But so, yeah, just the, the more you look at it, the, um, the, I think, the more I think I'm surprised the, about what they actually do. So. Yeah, I think some of the acquisitions like um, MuleSoft for the APIs, um, intelligent workflow, that was that was key to me at Shell. Right, everybody's built these big systems of record. Yeah, your, your SAP. Uh, AWS, Microsoft, um, Maximo, Primavera, and there, and you've spent a lot of money on them over the years. But what I did with MuleSoft was put that as a wrapper around those central systems, simplified those systems, got them back to what they were really good at, got the custom code out, and then use Salesforce as a wrapper around it. So essentially, I'm moving data using APIs. I'm getting rid of all the other things I had, plus plus all the in um, all the in-house uh, spaghetti. So my cost drops. I can innovate faster in the center there. I'm using a a platform provider in Salesforce that that comes out with three releases a year on most of its major platforms. I mean, that's incredible innovation just 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 driving forward there. But I'm bringing the data in and out of those central systems and providing one user experience and one way to interact with me as a company or for my employees to interact. And then I'm delivering device to the device of choice, the relevant information somebody needs to do their job in the location they're going to do it. You know, prior to that, a salesman had to sign on to SAP, uh, maybe going to the customer call center information, product information, uh, the latest information from the chatbots, whatever it might have been before they visited a customer. And by the time they've looked at all that, and remember passwords across five or six systems, I'd have preferred them to be out on the road. Oh, and by the way, the data is out of date by the time they've dropped it into Word or whatever they use and off they go. I want, I want them to be out there with their tablet or whatever. They click on the right icons and up comes the information about that customer. They can drill into that information using, say, um, Tableau or, or, or whatever your analytics platform is. Get the, Have a proper conversation with the customer, up-to-date information. If the customer called the call center five minutes before you walked in the door, you know because it's there. Mm-hmm. And you, you're far more professional. You're far more prepared. And then, because that information is all there and it's being shared within that cloud infrastructure, suddenly your area manager, instead of just phoning you up and saying, oh, how's it going? can actually start helping you by saying, hey, hey, Dave, I see that particular opportunity has been stuck in the funnel for a while. Tell, tell me about that one. Maybe I can help. So instead of a scattergun approach where, you know, you're not, you're just asking things, let's become a data-driven company. You know, instead of switching on email first thing in the morning at Salesforce, I look at my dashboard first thing in the morning. Yeah, you know, it's slightly customized for me because, I mean, customized configured. I did it myself, right? I mean, it's drag and drop because there were specific things I wanted to know. So on my key customers, I get information fed to me. I can see anything that came in on the news overnight about those customers. I'm prepared. I'm ready. This has got nothing to do with email. This is me pulling together on a dashboard the information I need. You've got to become a data-driven company. You've got to empower your people to see the data and make decisions. You and use the use that's the, words, the way it's changing, yeah. No, absolutely. You use the word innovation, and that, that yeah. and that that's something I know you, you know you have a passion for for yeah. technology innovation. But how do you go about creating a culture of innovation within an organization? Well, I I think it's I think it's difficult, but I think you can do certain things. You know, the bigger the company, the harder it is to change in some respects. The harder it is it's not so hard to innovate. But to actually deploy that innovation is hard, yeah? And so, you know, one of the things I learned, I tried to take my IT department and and things like the Salesforce platform and indeed other platforms are perfect for this, right? Is when I started out as a programmer, back to your first question in 1981, and I sat down with someone from the business, I had 80 characters across my screen and 24 lines down. And I think the 24th line was reserved for system messages, right? I would sit down with someone and in an afternoon, I'd mock up the screen for them. And we'd go, yeah, that's pretty much right. Let's go for it. One of my battle cries in Shell was I want to see prototypes, not PowerPoint. In Salesforce, I know I can knock up a screen, a report, an analytics dashboard in, in hours, certainly in days, right? So let's get back to not writing big reports and all of that. Let's get back to showing people what it is they're asking for. In the background, my architects have to really understand this stuff, because when you speed things up, the danger is you create chaos faster. And I'm trying to reduce chaos and get my costs down right, um, and use that money to, to, 
to put into the innovation. So your architects, your data architects, solution integration are really, really important. They have to be first rate because basically I'm building a house by starting with a bit of the kitchen, doing some wiring and plumbing in the bathroom, putting a tree in the back garden. And if I lose sight of what I'm doing, it's going to be a disaster. But think about how you drive value at speed. Think about how you innovate in that world, right? And for me, that was, don't let's try and roll out this great new idea to 3,000 salesmen or 3,000 engineers, because we'll be here in 18 months time still arguing about it, and we won't be getting very far. Let's go find those 10 salesmen who are getting beaten up in their market, a losing market share. Maybe it's a new market entry, and, and they are saying, we cannot go on like this. Let's go build in 30, 60, 90 days a minimum viable product or even a deployable, you know, pretty deployable product by the end of the 90 days that is really going to make a difference for them. We're going to work, you know, do the, the agile development, stand up, stand up meetings, scrums, all of these new, you know, modern and trendy things to do. But let's really concentrate on those 10 people, because if we get it right for them, a number of things happen. Your business goes, wow, I never knew IT could do anything this fast. You're using, you know, the APIs you're building to move the data in the background. You're, but what happens is they start, their business starts to take off. Maybe they're getting better margin. Maybe they're closing more deals. At the end of the quarter, their, their EVP of their business stands up and you make sure he or she says, hey, you know, IT delivered this. We tried it out in this market with these 10 guys. Look what's happening. The next day you have 20 more people at your door saying, well, why the hell's Mary got that? And I haven't. This is completely unfair. We want that. So you turn them into champions of change for you. You turn them into the people that drive the innovation. IT must not get itself put in a position of being the salesman, of pushing it. Yeah. But in order to do that, we have to gain our credibility by moving at real speed, tracking the value of everything we do, and getting into the hands of the people where it's going to make a positive difference to the, to the bottom line of that business. You know, and this was part of my drive in IT, was I wanted everybody in IT to think commercially. What do they do to influence money gained or money lost in the business every day? And do they understand the business? Do they understand the competitive pressures? Do they understand the opportunities? Can I go have a discussion with a business person where I bring thought leadership? I challenge. I don't just accept. I push. But you've got to gain credibility to do that. But innovation to me is that whole piece I have to be a business person first who happens to have an IT toolkit. I have to know how to talk with the business. I have to know how to listen. I have to know how to go explore what they're doing. You know, I would say to my folks, I expect you to spend a day a month out there on the road with people in the business. Go spend a day with a salesman. Go to a distribution terminal. Go out with a tanker driver. Go sit next to one of our traders or one of our digital marketers. Watch what they do and see how lousy our IT is. But because you have a technical toolkit, you should be able to sit there and go, damn, I can put that right quite quickly. I can make a huge difference to this. You know, hey, how about I try this with you? And you've got to innovate with people. You can't do it in a room in the back office. Absolutely agree with that. No, that, 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 that's absolutely excellent advice. The, the, the problem I have now is that we've got so many things I'd love to cover off and so, <laughs> so little time. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the last questions I want to ask is what has been the best bit of advice that you received during your career and what advice would you give others who are starting out on their journey now? Oh, gosh, it's kind of around a couple of things, right? I think when I look back on my career, I had a reputation for delivering. Yeah. So many people in life are very good at talking, are very clever. You know, many of the big companies hire incredibly clever people. They're not always very good at getting the job done. Not always good at focusing on what matters and what doesn't. You know, the higher up an organization you go, the more you have to filter out the noise and react to the stuff that really matters. So I think over my career... People would say I got a um, I got a reputation for delivery. Now I will temper that by saying it's not about delivering at all costs. The other piece of um, advice I would give people is respect your colleagues, respect other people. There have been times in my career when I've been so cross with somebody or so annoyed, and actually you need to stand back and say, look. There aren't stupid people in my company. There are not people in my company who deliberately try and do things wrong. We both have the same data. 
So why is it they view this so differently? And the advice is you've got to go get inside their heads. Why is it if we're both confronted with the same situation, they want to do something completely opposite to me, and we both think each other is stupid? Now, it's not because the data is different. We've both got the same data. So it's got to come down to experience, knowledge, education. Something is making Dave make a different decision to Craig. So before I get annoyed and write you off as a fool and go tell, tell everyone I don't like Dave, never do things like that in a company. Sit down with Dave. Don't send an email. I've seen that happen where people send each other nasty emails all day and then copy me in at some point, right? And I just got up, went and found them both and locked them in a room for a while. Um, talk to that person. Sit down and talk to them and ask, I don't see why you're thinking this, Dave. Can you explain it to me? Mm -hmm. And as, as, as I was told, you know what, Craig? You might actually find you were wrong and they were right. Or you might actually see their point of view and understand there's another way to do this. So I think taking time to listen, which I'm not good at, um, it, trying to get into the, see things from the other person's point of view are really, really important things you should do. And then be authentic. So sorry, I, I'm giving you too many really, but it's, it's delivered. It's all good. See it from other people's point of view and be respectful for people and work for companies where you are being true to yourself. You know, I think authenticity is incredibly important. If you're not authentic to what you believe in, people catch you out. And we see it with our politicians all the time. I think we have the most unauthentic bunch of people going at the moment. If you, people know instinctively if what you're talking about, you believe in. So understand what you stand for. And then in all interactions you have, be true to that understanding. You know, and I was coached on this at one point. There is no point in one day, Somebody comes to see me and says, oh, I made this mistake. Can you talk to me about it? I go, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, sit down. Let's let's go through this. The next day they come and ask the same question. And I and I yelled them out for being a fool. Right. You've got to be consistent. People want consistency from leadership. They want authenticity from leadership. And people know when they get it and when they don't. And I think deliver, listen to other people, take your time with other people. Don't dismiss their ideas. If they don't agree with you, take time to get behind the idea and understand why they think that. And by the way, if it turns out their idea won't work and yours will, they'll still be much happier because they've had a time, they've had a chance to explain it and to work through it. And maybe in the, the way you work through it, there's a realization, yeah, your idea doesn't quite work, but then neither does mine. If we put the two together, we've got a better solution. You know, and the final thing I would say is I often talk about leadership and I think it's an in incredibly elusive thing, which is why people write loads of books around it. But everybody is a leader. It doesn't matter whether it was when I was 21 and leaving university or whether it's now. And actually, I don't have a team these days uh, for the first time in many years. Um, or I'm part of a team, but I don't have people uh, reporting to me. But, you know, leadership can be about your your little brother or sister looks up to you or uh, you, you're doing something at university and people see you as a leader at doing that, or you belong to the local football team or a social club or you know, whatever it might be. But somebody somewhere, I promise you, looks up to you as a leader. And I think the most important thing you can do, and it, and it comes from a quote in the film, um, Evictus from, um, from uh, uh, Nelson Mandela's character, and whether he said it or not, I don't know. But, you know, most people when asked their views on leadership, they say, well, you know, I uh, lead by example. And that's great. And that's very fair. But I think leadership, the essence of leadership is in my interaction with people, I, I enable them to be better than they ever thought they could be. I enable them to be better than I, they ever thought they could be. Yeah. And I think if you can go through life helping people be better than they ever thought they can be, you'll make a pretty good leader. And if you deliver at the same time, you will go far. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Craig. That's been uh, an excellent insight to your experience, your career. Thank you very much. I'm sure our audience will really appreciate all, all the information you've provided today. So it's, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. So thank you once again for being part of the Inspiring Tech Leaders podcast. Absolute pleasure, Dave, and, and great to see you again. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and stay tuned for more Inspiring Tech Leaders. 